You can't talk about art history without seeing the impact Catholicism has had on art and the impact that art has had on Catholicism. It's time for our monthly art history lesson with Charles and Amanda Shepard from the Fort Wayne Museum of Art. This is Kyle Hyman. I am here at the Fort Wayne Museum of Art with Charles Shepard, the CEO, and Amanda Shepard, the COO mm-hmm. here at the museum. Mm-hmm. Thank you for having me again. Thanks Always for having good us to on. Be with you. What are we going to be learning about today? Well, we're going to be talking about Mary and her role in art of the Catholic Restoration. And when we talk about Catholic Restoration, we really mean what the church's response was in the wake of the Protestant Reformation and uh, the Council of Trent, which was mid 16th century didn't say that art should be our primary means of engaging the faithful, but it it can be a very powerful means of showing them what the meaning of the sacraments are in the teachings of the church. And also today, as we'll talk about the figures of the church. Mm -hmm. Figures being? Mary, Uh uh, angels, saints, religious. Mm -hmm. Um, We're focusing on Mary because she, she's the queen of our church Uh and she also enjoys a very privileged role in art. She's shown as advocate, teacher, humble servant, queen of heaven. Uh, she's very active in restoration art. Hmm. When before she may have been depicted as a serene saint receiving our prayers, not necessarily acting on our behalf, the church really wanted to emphasize that she is our advocate and she is she's going to her son on behalf of the people. Well, and this kind of expression is coming in response to a new style in art, the Baroque style, which is going to emphasize drama and action and a flurry of things going on. And we're looking at a painting by Federico Barocci this morning, and essentially, he's a master of this. I mean, that's a whole stage scene of activity, all taking our eye to Mary, though, as she looks to Jesus on our behalf. Yeah, because, I mean, she is a focal point, but not necessarily the only sure. focal point in the painting. Let me tell you why this was painted, and then okay. we'll talk a little bit about the composition. Yeah, It was painted for the confraternity of Santa Maria della Misericordia, and for those of you who don't know what a confraternity is, it's mm-hmm. an association of pious laymen committed to charity and acts of mercy. Okay, So they commissioned this painting, and they really wanted something that showed Mary as advocate of the people. Madonna del Popolo, which is the title of the painting, Madonna of the People, okay. was painted in 1579. It is now at the Uffizi Gallery in Florence. Mm-hmm. It is crowded with people. As Charles said, that, uh-huh. that was a marker of this style. So many figures in this painting, so many colors. It's a little sweet. The putti angels in heaven, uh-huh. um, really cherubic, you know, rosy skin. Rosy behind there, <laughs> <laughs> um, women with rosy cheeks and very angelic faces. Um, so the painting is horizontally bisected by the people below, mm-hmm. and then you have the dove of the Holy Spirit in almost the very center of the painting. Mm-hmm. And that is the pivotal point that links Mary above it. And then she's looking up at her son, and he occupies the highest position in the painting. And he is holding out his hand over the people. And beneath him, Mary is, her hand is gesturing toward the people. Mm -hmm. Look at your people. Yeah. And they create sort of this three way triangle relationship the Holy Spirit. Mary, Jesus, back down to the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And behind them all is the light of heaven, the light of our Father. Mm -hmm. So the people below, there are beggars, there are noble people, there are soldiers, there are religious. Right underneath the Holy Spirit, we see uh, a monk, it looks like, in deep prayer. Mm -hmm. And then there are noblemen and mothers and their children, there's even a little dog in the lower corner. <laughs> yeah. So this is real life. Yeah. This is what people are doing. Even onlookers who are trying to understand what is this grand moment that these people are experiencing, uh, they're on the fringes, though. Mm-hmm. And, and so I think we're trying to draw them to the faith 
and and the, the onlookers uh, in particular look to be elders in the community who may need to be brought back to the light. Hmm. And so all of these people, they're very crowded together. Uh, they're one people and they're engaged in acts of mercy. Um, one figure is giving alms. Um, mothers cradling their children. Mothers pointing to Jesus. They're showing their children uh, Jesus. A beggar receiving food, prayer. You know, these people are doing good things. Mm -hmm. And Mary is showing Jesus, look at your people doing good things. Look at their good works. Mm -hmm. Don't look at their sins. Look at their good works. And he very tenderly is reaching gesturing out his hand and it's illuminated by a bright white light almost like he's going to reflect the light back down onto them hmm. um, his head is turned in a gentle loving gaze they're all floating on uh, luscious silky <laughs> robes clouds light angels you know they're in in perfect heaven and it's not that the people below aren't but they're crowded they don't have the clouds or the light as much you can imagine the noise mm -hmm. that they're in and and sort of you know elbowing each other a little bit on top of each yeah, other yeah right right little. but you know the beggar is right next to the noble woman mm -hmm. and the soldier and the um you know the regular the regular people and the children and everybody's all we're all in it together mm -hmm. and and mary is she's of the people she's our advocate and she's showing jesus what's going on yeah now, Baracci is a fascinating artist in that more than probably anybody at this time, he believed that there should be many, many sketches preceding the production of the actual painting itself. Mm -hmm. And so in this case, every single figure in this whole painting, which there are 40, 50 figures, um, everyone has a set of drawings about that one. Some are black and white. Some are black and white with touches of color for the rosy in the cheeks. He's, uh -huh. trying to, he's testing out, how's that, how's that going to fly for this one figure? And then he puts that figure into a larger grouping and does a sketch with a few more people. I think almost 2,000 sketches Whoa. were made in, in anticipation of this panel. So how long does something like this take? Oh, this has got to take over a year. Yeah. And, and he, he's just going to dedicate his studio to that yeah. for that whole year. When he first came to Rome in the 1550s, he met Michelangelo, who was aging at the time. <laughs> um, and then he, he fell ill and thought that he had been poisoned by one of his rivals. So he left, but then he came back and then he joined. Um, he was a layman of the Capuchin order, which was a really effective congregation in the restoration. Uh -huh. One other interesting historical fact is that the Feast of the Holy Rosary was established in 1573, not long after the close of the Council of Trent. And so after that, depictions of Mary abounded in art. And huh. she was seen everywhere into the religious houses, churches, private homes. This one was painted in 1579, mm -hmm. so six years after that feast. Um, so we see after that time, Mary is more active. She's more present. She's really essential to the life of the people. So one of the things that you mentioned in here is the Holy Spirit being kind of this dividing line between heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. But right below the Holy Spirit, there's still a couple angels mm -hmm. that are kind of clinging to Mary. Mm -hmm. Almost like a, <laughs> like a, like a baby would cling to its mom or something sure, like that. Exactly. Uh, but also they, like if we think about it, like the angels, we have guardian angels right. and things like that. Mm -hmm. like, so they are kind of a bridge. Mm hmm between heaven mm -hmm. and earth. That's really is, interesting, Kyle. You know, because it, it's like the Holy Spirit, this almost diminutive figure in this painting, which I think the Holy Spirit can be overlooked mm -hmm. uh, because it's not embodied necessarily, right, right. even in our own. Like, yeah. It's hard for us to imagine what the Holy Spirit right. is. So it's shown as a dove. Well, uh -huh. dove is small, yeah. but it's governing everything in this. And, you know, the <sighs> angels are sort of frolicking around. And yeah, the angels are closer to the people than the Holy Spirit. So the angels would have been used as a device that linked the people to right. heaven as well. The one thing this reminds me of, her gesturing, Mary's gesturing, is the wedding of Cana 
where she goes to Jesus asking mm-hmm. him to help out these people that mm-hmm. are in need. Mm-hmm. And it's almost kind of like, come on, you can do something. Mm-hmm. Look, look at yeah. these, these people out here. You can help. I'm, I'm trying to be a mom to them and they need some help. <laughs> and I know you can help them. And it's, it's like this pleading on our behalf that she's this intercessor for us. Right. And, and yet the painter shows her gesturing in such a, I mean, you, her hands and her, she's so beautiful. Yeah. You know, she's not, frantic it's, it's elegant it's elegant yeah. she's she's just want her hand outstretched and that's all it is that's all it takes yeah and jesus sees that and his hand also very you know gently presiding over i mean it's, it's his face is almost saying like okay fine <laughs> if you insist i'll oh, do it oh yeah, he's like, <laughs> like oh, yeah. <laughs> all I, right, I know. Mom, I got these I'll give him a blessing. <laughs> <laughs> there's it's, the blessing. A, it's kind of that hand out like a like. I'm a sure that's what yeah. he was thinking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is. No, it looks a lot like what a bishop will do, um, or you know, as a priest, you know, concludes mass and he's walking out. Yeah. His hand is very gently to the people. Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, again, another great history lesson for us. And I encourage people to check this out because there's so much detail going into it. And uh, like you said, there's just a lot lot to read into it, a lot to look at and different people doing different things. Yeah. So I'll put a link to that in today's show notes. People can check it out, kylehyman.com. But what else is going on here at the museum? We have a really big show right now. It is a retrospective of the work of Julian and Barbara Steincheck. Uh, Julian is deceased. Barbara is his widow. And she is working with us to create a retrospective of their work. Julian was the pioneer of optical art. Hmm. Uh, and they, though they had different styles of art, they worked together uh, over many years. What, so, What does optical art mean? Art that plays with color and line to create optical experiences. Huh. So like optical illusions? Not necessarily illusions. Okay. It's more a case of, and this goes back to Julian's uh, training when he was in grad school. He trained with Joseph Albers, and Joseph Albers devoted his whole career to the exploration of colors next to another color, mm-hmm. such that if you put this shade next to that shade, you might get a vibration, for instance, uh-huh. or you might get something more serene, or you know what would happen? And so Albert's career was about finding out what would happen if this red were next to that purple or whatever uh-huh. you have. So Steinzak took that and ran with it and thought, if I could make complicated geometric patterns and then drop certain colors in, you're going to think you're vibrating or it's vibrating. Mm. And th- there are some people, honestly, that even looking at the big books we have, I get a little nauseous yeah. and dizzy looking at the pictures. They're gorgeous, but they do seem to move. Huh. Steinzeck was challenged, I would tell you, too, because his right hand uh, during World War II, he was interned in a labor camp and beaten so bad that he lost the use of his right arm and hand. Hmm. So he had to teach himself to paint with his left hand, and you'd think that would mean he wouldn't do precise works. Right. But these are very precise. Huh. All right. Well, people have to check it out. Stop yeah. by the museum. Check out the website, fwmoa.org. Mm-hmm. Also, That's FWMOA right. on the social media. Sure. So, all right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charles and Amanda Shepard. Thank you. Thank you.